All right, before I get going, I want to point out that I'm from Oklahoma State, not OU for you Tennessee football fans out there. So uh, we, we've borne the brunt of OU bad behavior for many years at Oklahoma State, so I know where you're coming from. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, the need for prescribed fire to maintain the genetic integrity of shortleaf pine. And before I jump into that, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, John Stewart. Uh, this is part of his PhD work, and also he's a postdoc for a lot of this work. But then from the Forest Service, Jim Goulden, Barb Crane, and, and Dana Nelson. So the, the issue is that since the 1950s, there's been a huge increase in hybridization between loblolly pine and shortleaf pine across the range, uh, from about 3% to 46% from 1950s to 2000s. Uh, and these were, were data collected from uh, southwide southern pine seed source that were trees established in the 1950s compared to seedling populations from the same areas currently. And here is some data from John's dissertation work, uh, but it shows the, uh, the allopatric and sympatric ranges of shortleaf and loblolly. Uh, kind of that, I guess, pinkish, reddish color to the north is the allopatric range of shortleaf. The blue to the south is the allopatric range of loblolly. And then the purple is the sympatric range or the shared range. And what this shows is um, kind of the percent hybrids found in the populations sampled. And the red is for the shortleaf populations, the blue is for the loblolly populations. And there should be two bars in each of those boxes. Okay. The bar to the left is the 1950s, the bar to the right is the current. And many times there's no bar to the left because there were no hybrids back in 1950s. But you can see the, the actual data, there's a lot of variability across the range from the different populations collected. But say up there in uh, southeast Oklahoma, there were no shortleaf hybrids measured in the 50s, and now it's about 80%. So taken to its extreme, I guess you could say that shortleaf pine may be at risk of extinction through introgression. Uh, and there's just a, a loblolly pine stand, a shortleaf pine stand side by side, and uh, I guess you can as Jim pointed out, it's tough to tell them apart, and they, they often perform similar ecological functions. And, and Jim touched on this a little bit, but you know, they, they share the sympatric range since at least the last glaciation has moved northward. You know, why were they not hybrids? Because they, they can hybridize, but why weren't there some? And as Jim covered, there's difference in pollen time shed. Uh, there also was habitat separation. Uh, shortleaf was found on the, the drier sites, loblolly in the more music sites. And then fire was a reinforcing factor. Uh, and differences in, in adaptation to fire between the two species probably reinforced those differences and helped maintain species integrity. So what's different now? Um, well, we probably do have some increased cross-fertilization occurring. Uh, we've probably have climate change, or in Oklahoma we can't say climate change, we call it uh, variability in weather. Uh, <laughs> it's They're persistent, cool. persistent, uh, yeah, <laughs> just weather. <laughs> uh, Maybe leading to more overlapping pollen shed, and we've got planting of non-clonal sort, or non-local sources far north uh, of its, its range. And also habitat fragmentation can lead to increased hybridization. But what I'm going to really talk about today is the re removal of that selection pressure that probably removed a lot of the hybrids, namely fire exclusion. So it'd be a, a post-fertilization mechanism to remove hybrids. I get this question a lot is why do we care? Um, you know, they, they perform similar ecological functions. A red cockaded woodpecker doesn't care if it's a loblolly or a shortleaf or a hybrid. Uh, but why do we care? The hybrids grow faster than shortleaf, isn't that a good thing in some ways? And if I talk to some of my colleagues who might be evolutionary biologists, they'll tell me that stuff happens. You know, species are always changing and merging and so forth to adapt to changing uh, conditions. So, so why do we care? And, and I'd say that the biggest reason is resilience. Um, So shortleaf is more fire tolerant. 
I've got a typical loblolly stand burning up on the left, right? And then a typical <laughs> short leaf pine. Okay, I've obviously chosen pictures to accentuate my point. Okay, short leaf is more ice and, and snow tolerant. Short leaf is more drought tolerant. Right? So if we're faced with changing climate conditions and perhaps increased disturbance and, and more severe disturbances, having short leaf out in the landscape, pure short leaf is potentially very important. So uh, in addition to resilience, I, I'd argue that we care because um, it, you know, that this huge increase does in, indicate to me a, a perturbation of the system. And then also once we cross a threshold in hybridization, we may not be able to go back if conditions change to favor pure shortleaf pine. Uh, I like biodiversity and, and I say I like shortleaf pine and I assume we like shortleaf pine, otherwise you wouldn't be here. All right, so, so we've been doing some research uh, to look at some of these questions, uh, to look and see whether there's a, a physiological and morphological advantage of being a hybrid or how the, they, they differ from the parent species, and also determine the role of fire exclusion. And I'm presenting this, but this is the result of a lot of work from a lot of different people. Uh, some manuscripts that have come out over the last four or five years. Uh, if you do want more detail, please contact me. I can send you the PDFs of the original manuscripts. Okay, but what, what we know about the hybrids, um, we know they grow as fast as loblolly, or can grow as fast as loblolly. They have intermediate needle characteristics. They're more fusiform resistant uh, to rust. Uh, it's like a short leaf. Uh, they have better cold resistance than loblolly, and they have better form than loblolly. But the things we don't know are its ability to re-sprout after top kill or its fire adaptation. And I'm focusing here on the basal crook that was mentioned a couple times already today. And in case you didn't know the basal crook, there's a good picture from Maddie Mattoon's 1915 publication, 100 years old now, uh, showing it. And there's our own Dr. Jim Goulden demonstrating the basal crook to a class of OSU silviculture. Uh, but it grows up, and then it bends down, and it grows back up again, and it puts dormant buds that developed in the axles of the primary needles at the soil surface level, okay, where they're insulated from fire because they're in contact with the soil, or in the case of Mattoon's drawing, he shows some soil movement and accumulation on top that protects those buds, so that when they're top killed by fire or clipping, they re-sprout. And there's a picture of a re-sprouting short leaf on the Washita. There's another one, a little bit bigger. Uh, there, there's some char on that stem, and then just below the char, there's a basal crook, and you can see the, the sprouts originating from that crook. All right, so we asked the question, you know, how do these hybrids, you know, how do they respond to top kill? And we went out and top clipped. So we took a pair of clippers and just snipped them, um, and we did a nursery study. In the nursery, we planted short leaf, loblolly, and artificial F1 hybrids. So half loblolly, half short leaf. There it is the first year. There it is the third year. All right, and there's some response after top clipping. Uh, that cluster of green is actually a, a cluster of sprouts. And then, let's see if I can do this. There is a loblolly right there with no sprouts. In terms of data, uh, this is after two and into the third growing seasons. Uh, you can see the couple treatment dates there. But the black bar on the left of those clusters is loblolly, then it's hybrid, then short leaf to the right. And loblolly will re-sprout when top clipped. If you take a pair of clippers and clip it above the dormant buds, it'll re-sprout. Uh, at a lower frequency than short leaf, and that ability does drop off very quickly after about age three. Uh, short leaf almost all re-sprouted with top clipping, and the hybrids performed much more similar to short leaf than loblolly. So the hybrids do have an advantage compared to, to loblolly for sure in its ability to, to re-sprout. But what we noticed really interestingly was that the morphology of the basal crook is very different with the hybrids. We've got a loblolly with no basal crook, the short leaf on the right with this what we call a strong basal crook, where we've got a, 
a segment of stem that's parallel to the soil surface. And the hybrid has a weaker, what we call a non-functional crook. It's got a, a bend in it, but it doesn't truly lower the buds to the soil surface. Okay, and, and that got us to thinking, well, how important is that basal crook? Maybe in hybrids, it's not protecting it from fire. Okay, that led to kind of that thought process in, in the discovery. And here's the data from that nursery study. Uh, short leaf, the majority had crooks, and most of those were strong crooks. Loblolly, very few had any stem deformation. And of the hybrids that crook, most of them had that weak crook. And I should point out, you know, Wayne talked about earlier, uh, nursery-grown trees do not all have crooks. Uh, we found that, and that's even referenced way back with Wakeley's work. Uh, and my personal hypothesis is they just don't have the room to physically bend over and make that crook and form that crook. Uh, but, but we're certain that, in this case, that they are true shortleaf pine. And if you look at kind of the height of the sprouts, the height of those buds, sure enough, the, the shortleaf are at the soil surface. The hybrids, the buds are held higher, and then the wobbly pine are up a, a good inch or so above the, the soil surface. So that got us to, you know, is the crook important? You know, is this important in terms of fire and the potential for fire to remove the hybrids? And that led to our next study <coughs> where we actually did some burning, some little small prescribed, I won't call them prescribed fires, little miniature fires around seedlings to both the F1 hybrids as well as pure lob and pure short leaf again. And we did this in Oklahoma and we burned after the first growing season and also in the second growing season. Here's our study site. Those little gray patches are our little, little burns. We piled up about six inches deep of pine straw. Had a nice little backfire through there and killed the seedlings. There's one smoldering. And then there's a picture of the fire in progress as well as a re-sprouted short leaf and a loblaw that did not re-sprout. But what we found though it was basically all the loblaw were killed by those fires. We had one hybrid that resprouted, only one, and about half the shortleaf survived. And that one hybrid that resprouted actually had a strong crook. So. Moving forward into the second growing season, trees got bigger. Same thing. All the loblaw died from a summer burn. One hybrid survived and most of the shortleaf survived. That one hybrid that survived, survived because of fire ants got in there and disturbed the soil and raised the soil up. So, so yes, I would say that in terms of the, and this was related to crooking also. So the, the crook characteristic related very well to the response we got. So I'd say yes, that the crook is important and also prescribed fire will eliminate hybrids. All right. We ask a similar question about, well, how would repeated prescribed fire do in, say, shifting or, or altering uh, the seedling populations? So not just a little miniature fire, but actually operational prescribed fires. We went down to tall timbers, which I think Jim, you mentioned earlier, has a, somebody did, has a mixed canopy of actually loblolly and shortleaf. It's the perfect place to do it. Um, and we went down and sampled from the seedling population and they have some unburned controls for over 30 years unburned as well as most of the area they burn every other year. And here's a Google Earth image. Uh, here's the unburned control patch. It's basically pine, hardwood right now. And then here's the burned every other year. And we took transects along here and along here and basically took the, the seedlings back and used the same genetic markers that John had used for his PhD. And what we found was that, well, in the unburned areas, the seedling population was a mix of loblolly, hybrid, and shortleaf. So 30% hybrids and majority, or, or the, the species of greatest frequency was, was loblolly pine. But with burning, loblolly was gone. Uh, there were 15% hybrids, 85% shortleaf with the, the biannual fires. And of those hybrids, two thirds of those we found were actually back crossed two with shortleaf. So they were only one, Dana, correct me if I'm wrong, only one eighth wobbly pine, seven eighths shortleaf pine. 
So even the hybrids we found with the burned area were predominantly short leaf character. So yeah, you can, this worked. Prescribed fire will eliminate hybrids, keep hybrids out. Also keeps law boy out. Uh, and also I'd, I would argue that you've got a window that you've got to apply prescribed fire because once those hybrids get big enough to withstand prescribed fire, they will persist indefinitely. So it's repeated and, and frequent enough fire to, to keep the hybrids out if that's your management goal. <coughs> All right, so some conclusions uh, from all that work. Um, the, the hybrid pines do have some competitive advantages. They grow fast, they sprout more like a, a short leaf than a loblolly. Uh, but they lack that strong basal crook. They've got that weak or non-functional crook that makes them susceptible to fire. Okay? And we've, we've shown that prescribed fire will kill hybrids and then also a, a regular burning regime will keep hybrids out. So I've heard shortleaf called a, a fire adapted species. And I'm gonna take it a step further and call it a fire dependent species. Going back to Mattoon again, 1915, he wandered throughout the interior highlands and basically says that fire was everywhere, the shortleaf was, and all shortleaf stands had basically re-sprouted. And if, if you've never read Mattoon's book, you can find it online. I think I found it on Google Docs one time, so it's available. Is it on the website even? Yeah. It's online. It's online. So I recommend you, it's a fantastic publication. Uh, and so, so I'd argue that shortleaf pine is it's fire dependent in terms of regeneration and, and establishment but it's also fire dependent to maintain its very genetic integrity. Because without prescribed fire or fire, the number of hybrids is, is increasing dramatically. All right, so what does this mean in terms of management? Um, well, mechanical damage is not enough. You can't go out and do clipping. You gotta use fire, which for you guys, that all makes sense, I, I know. Um, prescribed fire can be used to eliminate hybrids in Loblaw Pine. Seedling age, size matter. And in, in terms of prioritizing places to do restoration, without fire, it doesn't matter. And not just for, for maintaining structure, but it doesn't matter in terms of maintaining genetic integrity as well. A little bit about artificial regeneration. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about that coming up, but we should remove the hybrids from the orchards. So, uh, you know, the, the um, clonal stock in, in the orchard should be removed if it's a hybrid. And in terms of planting, like, like Wayne was mentioning, um, plant deep. Uh, protect those dormant buds. Uh, I don't know if it's possible at nurseries to, to sow them a little bit wider spacing to maybe get a crook to develop. But even if it doesn't develop, it's fine. Planting deep is, is adequate. All right, so the question about hybrids in the orchards has come up a couple times. And uh, this is a paper that's been submitted to Journal of Forestry. And, and John Stewart uh, used the same molecular markers he used for his dissertation to look at the hybrid character of those trees that are uh, in the current nursery stock. And, and the news is good. Okay, there's about eight to 10 percent of Forest Service clones are uh, have hybrid character, either F1 or one-time back cross to, to short leaf. Uh, and in the seedling populations, we also sampled commercially available seedlings, and it didn't seem like there was a lot of pollen contamination from loblaw pine. The rates of hybrids within the seedlings we got were about the same as the, the clonal stock from the seed orchards. Uh, and I, I, I know exactly what the frequency owes for, the, for Wayne's stuff. IF1191 had 10% clones, and IF1193 had 5% clones. And so the, um, but the goal moving forward should be to rogue those trees that have been identified as, as hybrids from the, uh, the nurseries, or the, the orchards. All right, so here's Maddie Mattoon. And I, I would argue that we need a modern day Maddie Mattoon. 
He was a forest examiner, which I think has got to be the coolest job ever. Uh, but there he is. He, he traveled throughout the southern pine areas and documented those. That's obviously not shortleaf pine he's standing in, but that's the only photo I could find of, of Matty. But we need somebody to speak for the, the pines. And I, I think we have that person. <laughs> There's, is that Matty? No, that's Jim Mattoon Goulden, I think. <laughs> No initials there. Yeah, there you go. So who looks remarkably like Maddie Mattoon. When I saw that, I was like, that's, that's Jim Goulden, who does a wonderful job speaking for the trees. So. And with that, happy to answer any questions.